I'm Caleb Benjamin, intern at Lawfare, with an episode from the Lawfare Archive for November 26, 2023. In recent hearings in front of the Senate and House Committees on Homeland Security, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas and FBI Director Christopher Wray have repeatedly asked Congress to reapprove several legal authorizations that have lapsed or are lapsing, including, most notably, FISA Section 702. For today's Archive episode, I picked an episode from November 6, 2015, in which Kenneth Weinstein sat down with Caroline Crass, Oren Kerr, and Benjamin Wittes for a panel at the George Washington University and the CIA co-hosted event entitled Ethos and Profession of Intelligence. The panel discussed what new legal questions are raised by rapidly evolving technologies, how the questions interact with existing national security law, and how the United States can strike a balance between privacy, security, and the economic imperatives driving innovation. I'm Cody Poplin, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, November 7th, 2015. That was the voice of Caroline Crass, the General Counsel of the Central Intelligence Agency. Last week, George Washington University and the CIA co-hosted an event entitled Ethos and Profession of Intelligence. As part of the conference, Kenneth Weinstein moderated a conversation between Crass, Oren Kerr, and Benjamin Wittes on bridging 20th century law and 21st century intelligence. What new legal questions are raised by rapidly evolving technologies, and how do those questions interact with existing national security law? Can the United States strike a balance between privacy, security, and the economic imperatives driving innovation? The panel addresses these critical issues and more. It's the Lawfare Podcast, episode number 146, Building a Bridge Between 20th Century Law and 21st Century Intelligence. Okay, good to see everybody. As Frank said, I'm Ken Weinstein, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. We, uh, we have a panel of experts here to talk about uh, legal aspects of the intelligence community, intelligence operations in the 21st century, and the notion is that we're, uh, here we are dealing with challenges of the 21st century, largely with a legal structure and regulatory structure that was devised in the 20th, we we're in the 21st century, using a structure devised and formulated in the 20th century. So the question is, do we have the laws, do we have the rules, do we have the constitutional limitations in place that really fit today's intelligence realities? And for that question, we have a panel of experts here that I'm really thrilled to be with and I've been thrilled to work with over the years. So let me start off by just giving quick bios of each of the panelists, give you an understanding of their background, and then we'll just launch straight into some questions. Uh, Thank you, Frank, for introducing me. Um, Let me first start with Caroline Crass, who's to my immediate left. Caroline, as you know, is currently the general counsel of the CIA. Um, Prior to that, she had a number of positions throughout government in which she had uh, took a strong hand in policy making and uh, dealing with intelligence issues, including several stints in the Office of Legal Counsel of the Justice Department, which is where I worked with her including the acting assistant attorney general for that office um, and also uh, uh, principal deputy assistant AG for that office. She also worked as a special assistant U.S. attorney in the D.C. U.S. attorney's office uh, handling national security matters, and she was the deputy legal advisor at the NSC earlier in her career and then later was uh, in the White House um, under President Obama as well. She also has positions in her past in uh, the Treasury Department, where she was special assistant to the general counsel, uh, and as uh, attorney advisor in the Office of Legal Advisor at State Department. Uh, She's packed a lot uh, into her career. She has a BA from Stanford and a JD from Yale. Um, We were supposed to have David Chris, who is an old friend and colleague of ours, but unfortunately he uh, has an illness in his family and couldn't be here today, but he sends his regards to everybody. Next to Caroline, we also have uh, Ben Wittes. And Ben is a senior fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution. And he's also the co-founder and editor-in-chief of the Lawfare blog. Um, He's written numerous books and articles on cutting-edge legal issues, especially as they relate to the intelligence community. Um, And prior to his position with the Brookings Institution, he was with the Washington Post, specializing in legal affairs. 
Uh, prior to that, he was with the Legal Times, covered the Justice Department and regulatory matters. Um, and uh, he is a graduate of Oberlin College and has a black belt, and this is in his official bio, black belt in Taekwondo. And most importantly, by the way, he has put out a challenge to Vladimir Putin that he will engage in a match with Vladimir Putin. I keep waiting for a response. He's looking for a response. <laughs> but, but most importantly, unlike his uh, potential adversary, Ben has promised to keep his shirt on throughout this whole proceeding today. So, and then uh, last we have Oren Kerr. Uh, Oren is the Fred C. Stevenson Research Professor of Law here at GW. Um, and he, prior to that, he was a special AUSA in the Eastern District of Virginia, assistant U.S. attorney, and a trial attorney in the computer prime and intellectual property section of DOJ, clerk for Justice Kennedy of the Supreme Court, and Leonard Garth of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, and has written um, a number of books, been cited in thousands, literally thousands of academic works, has authored more than 50 articles, which I think is more articles than I've actually ever read, uh, and has uh, been on the cutting edge of computer legal issues um, and uh, the challenges in the digital age. So we've got um, a great panel of experts, and so why don't we go ahead and jump in and get started, and I will start with Caroline. Um, Caroline, I guess... The, uh, let's just start with the topic here. The topic for today is 20th century law and 21st century intelligence, which seems to suggest that there might be a disconnect between the legal structure that you operate under and the operational challenges that you deal with every day. It, is that the case? Is the existing legal structure something that needs to be updated? Is it a challenge to you? I'd be happy to talk about that. I'd like to just start by um, thanking you for moderating. Um, can I, as you mentioned, go back to days at the Justice Department together? And I also wanted to thank GW for co-hosting this event with the agency. Um, I know it's been a terrific day so far. And I want to thank the students who have um, registered. I understand a large number have. And to put in a plug for um, the excellent opportunities to work at the agency, either on the non-legal or on the legal side, if you go on to get a law degree. Um, I have a great group of lawyers, and I'm always interested in um, talented individuals coming to join us. Um, the last time I was on this stage, um, I was in the Nutcracker with the Washington Ballet. <laughs> I can't say that. <laughs> and I certainly never thought that over 30 years later I would be sitting here as the CIA general counsel, so anything is possible. <laughs> um, but turning back to your question, um, I think generally speaking that the current legal regime that we have works quite well for the CIA. And I think one of the reasons for that is because of our, our mission, um, some of our core missions include human intelligence collection, as well as um, conducting covert action activities as directed by the president. And those um, missions have both stayed constant ever since we were first established in 1947. And, um, and so we've had the legal authorities that have, were designed to allow us to help protect the nation that have been working together with um, a variety of protections stemming from the Constitution and from uh, statutes and executive orders to help protect um, the privacy and civil liberty interests of individuals. And I think they've worked um, quite well together. Um, as intelligence lawyers, uh, we always ask ourselves two questions whenever we have a particular activity that we have to determine whether it would be lawful or not. And the first one, um, the first thing that we look to is whether or not we have positive authority to, to undertake that activity. And so in terms of traditional foreign intelligence or counterintelligence activities, as long as they are for such a purpose, we have authorities to conduct those activities still today um, under the National Security Act and Executive Order 12333, which helps to implement uh, some portions of the National Security Act. Um, if it's a uh, covert action, for example, we need to make sure that we have authorization from the president in the form of a finding or a memorandum again, consistent with the National Security Act. So in the area of positive authority, I think we at the agency feel like we're doing quite well. Um, but there are definitely other areas where my colleagues in the IC um, are searching for additional authorities. Um, one example is in the field of uh, cybersecurity, and you know, the administration is in favor of legislation that would help um, DHS and FBI and NSA to um, be able to have a mutual information sharing with the private sector um, to help um, defend our 
both our country as well as the private sector against um, cybersecurity threats. So that's one area where I think that um, definitely legislation would be helpful. Um, in terms of the second aspect of what we look to when we are addressing a question about whether we can do something, we look after we know that we have the authority, we look to see what the applicable restrictions are. And so there again, we have um, the Constitution, uh, statutes, executive orders, um, and internal regulations that apply to us. Um, we operate under um, Attorney General approved guidelines that govern our ability to um, collect, retain, and disseminate information about U.S. persons. And those um, guidelines stem from just after um, EO 12333 was, um, was promulgated. So they stem from the early 1980s. And they're something that we are in the process of updating um, to make sure that they um, are fully, uh, take, fully take account of, of a number of evolutions, including the large volumes of data that we can now acquire because of the technological change changes. Um, but one thing about what we can and we can't do is that we, we cannot generally conduct electronic surveillance in the U.S. or unconsented physical search in the U.S. And so we at the agency haven't had to confront some of the difficult legal issues that I know that Ken had to face um, in his time at Justice and others have with respect to what the FBI and the NSA can do in terms of electronic surveillance within the United States. In terms of what we do on a sort of day-to-day -day basis, uh, we have, uh, for example, we might have a situation where we have recruited a foreign minister overseas to um, collect intelligence for us and to tell us what's happening in that foreign government so we have a good sense of what's going on and we can report that information back to the policymakers here. Um, in the normal course, that would uh, not present too many difficult legal challenges. But now, because of technology, there are some additional things we have to look at because he could, instead of just telling us what's going on, hand over a hard drive um, with um, thousands of documents on it. And because of the fact that we don't know exactly what's on the hard drive, um, we don't, it's a huge volume of information. Um, there are definite legal and policy challenges that exist now that don't, wouldn't have existed um, 50 years ago. Um, but for all those things, you know, in turn, we apply the framework I described of the two major questions we ask ourselves, and the lawyers in my office work really hard to do what I think lawyers and judges do across the country in terms of trying to apply the existing law to novel questions. Um, that, that certainly presents challenges, but it's one of the things that makes our job so interesting. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk some more about some of the other evolutions, you know, cyber, um, but... Okay. All right, Ben, let me turn to you. So Caroline has talked about the regulatory structure that she operates within and sort of made the general point that, at least from the CIA's perspective, the laws and the rules that they operate under generally work. Um, let me ask you about the oversight mechanism that's in place. Uh, the notion sort of underlying the intelligence community dating back to 1947 is that you have this you have the intelligence community operating under a certain level of oversight. That oversight, of course, got plussed up significantly in the 1970s uh, with the intelligence committees and the like. Um, but the idea is that while the intelligence community operates often covertly and secretly, um, it should be subject to sufficient oversight. One of the issues that's come up since the Snowden revelations about electronic surveillance and metadata or bulk data collection one of the issues is, boy, well, does this really work? Can we rely on Congress to provide the kind of oversight that we need when they're giving oversight over secret matters and they're not able to do that oversight publicly? Do you have thoughts about that? So my first thought is uh, that this is a perfectly surreal environment <laughs> in which to have a CIA uh, conference. All of you guys, and particularly your hair, because of the light, looks purple from here. <laughs> and everything that you hear once, we hear twice. Um, but once when we say it and once when it bounces back. So if we're all a little distracted, um, forgive us. Um, does, does, do I sound any more cogent the second time? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, look, I, I think your question... The, the dual sound here actually is a good metaphor for your question because I think there's, a, there's, there's actually, you have to ask that question twice. Is the, is the oversight regime working and effective? One is for people like us, you know, and for people who 
have some degree of tactile familiarity with the system. And look, I, I, I think the oversight mechanisms are actually pretty fabulous. And, um, and I, I, the more I have studied them and worked with them, the more impressed with them I am, not just the congressional mechanisms, um, but also the judicial mechanisms. And, you know, the essential compromise of 1978, 1980 as well, was this observation that we cannot have um, the normal oversight mechanisms in, of Congress and the judiciary, that is, public judicial review of agency activities, uh, public congressional oversight, but we want to create these subsets of these oversight institutions that are cleared, that can operate in a classified environment, and that can operate as proxies for the larger institutions. Now, if you're asking me, do you think those institutions work? Yeah, I do. I, I think, you know, not, not, not perfectly, not, there aren't certainly things that I, that all of these various institutions have done that have made me scratch my head over the years, but basically, I do believe the intelligence community operates under a remarkable, and by the way, unique in the world, uh, set of oversight restrictions and, and environment, and that that is a constraining effect on its behavior. Now, the second time when this noise comes back at us, and I ask, answer the question the second time, let me answer it from the point of view of, of a public that experienced the Snowden revelations. And I think the answer to that question is emphatically no. You know, one of the things we learn from the Snowden revelations and the public reaction to them is that the public does not trust, or a large segment of the public does not trust these oversight mechanisms. And the fact that, you know, the fact that um, these programs were briefed to committees, you know, numerous, what, 35-something FISA judges signed off on, you know, the 215 program, actually did not have a terribly legitimizing effect. And so I think one of the the real questions that we face now as we think about the legal structures and the oversight structures is, do we still believe in that 1978 compromise or not? Uh, and if we don't, what is the oversight mechanism, given that we're not going to do our intelligence operations in public, and we're not going to have a, le you know, a level of transparency? The intelligence community is not. I work for a think tank. One of the things the CIA does is a lot like a think tank, right, the analysis component. But the set of collections that go into the components of that analysis is not like a think tank, right? And so the Brookings Institution, we can have, you know, operate entirely on the basis of the public record, which we essentially do. Um, that's not an intelligence agency. That's a think tank. That's a university. Um, given that we're not going to run our intelligence programs in public, and we're not going to uh, conduct, you know, essentially all open source intelligence, I think we do have to ask ourselves, what, what is the oversight regime that we're actually going to have confidence in? What does that look like? And is it possible, right? Is there a possible set of oversight mechanisms that allows the intelligence community to be an intelligence community that people like us look at and say, hey, it's sort of basically working, it's getting to the, it's doing the oversight work that it needs to do, and that the general public looks at and says, I have more confidence in that than I do in the 1978 compromise. And I'm, not, I'm sort of not at all confident that that's a needle that we have any idea how to thread at this point. L let me follow up on that. So in terms of congressional oversight, and granted there's Court oversight, you've got the FISA court. There's internal executive branch oversight. You've got IGs, you've got the Intelligence Oversight Board, et cetera. But then let's focus on the congressional aspect. You've got the routine sort of day-to-day -day oversight. You, the mm -hmm. Intelligence community has the obligation to keep the intelligence committees um, fully, fully and currently, yeah. Yeah, informed. fully informed, is it fully and, and currently, currently informed yeah. um, about all important intelligence activities. But then there's the legislative aspect of it. And that's what I think seemed to have gotten highlighted by the Snowden revelations. And let me just ask you about the 215 example, where 215 was voted on, the intelligence committees had hearings on it, 
some number of legislators were briefed or took a, availed themselves the opportunity to be briefed, but not all. They passed the law, and then when it came out in the Snowden revelations how it was being used, many of the members felt like they um, hadn't sort of knowingly authorized that use. What's the option if um, you want to have Congress legislating in an area of secret operations, but you want to maintain the secrecy of those operations? Well, so, I mean, I've actually put forward a proposal here that I think would entirely solve the problem. Um, and by the way, it's a problem that, you know, the CIA has had if you look at the, you know, SSCI investigation on, on uh, you know, the, the interrogation program. There is a constant back and forth of argument about who was briefed at what level when. And I think there should just be a rule that when you get a briefing, you sign a form that says you got a briefing and that becomes part of the record. I don't think this is a tough issue, actually. This is an issue of members not wanting to be accountable for the things they've been told. And a lot of members, it's very visible and in, in, in the context of the 215 program, a lot of members bald-facedly lied about what they knew. And I, I don't know how to say that politely, um, so I'm <laughs> really not going to try. Um, but, you know, members of Congress don't always tell the truth. And... Um, <laughs> you heard it here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and I, I, I think the idea that, you know, one thing you could do to really improve oversight is force members to acknowledge when they've been briefed and what they've been briefed on. And um, then when it comes out and they don't want to take responsibility for it, there should be, you know, a paper record. And I don't think this is an unsolvable problem. I think it's, it's really a question of members not wanting that level of accountability as to their own behavior. And you know, frankly, I wonder if the community should be, uh, you know, a little bit more insistent about, um, you know, about there being a record of what members are, are, are told. Mem you know, the Congress has a lot of tools to push back against that, and I, um, but I really think there's, a, there's, there's value to the legislative accountability of, you know, when, when programs come out and become controversial, knowing who was told about what, when. Okay. Caroline, back to you on, uh, from where you sit. Do you think the congressional oversight works, the day-to-day -day oversight? Yeah, I definitely think, think it, that it does. I mean, that fully and currently informed translates into daily exchanges, either in person or over the phone, briefings, written notifications. And I know from my perspective, when I was at the Justice Department giving agencies advice about congressional oversight, you know, there's a little bit more caution about how much you would share with Congress about internal deliberative uh, matters. And at the agency, I think we lean forward to um, perhaps over-inform um, our oversight committees. And I think we do that knowingly because we know we don't have um, a public discussion of what we do. And so we feel a particular obligation because of our classified activities to make sure that the representatives of the people really know what we're doing and have a chance to push back. And they do push back as well. Um, it is rigorous in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, I'd just like to add, I know you alluded to the fact that there's internal executive branch oversight, the IGs and the IOB. There's also the um, President's Civil Liberties and Oversight Board with respect to counterterrorism matters that's been reinvigorated um, mm -hmm. recently. And they play a critical role. And also something I think people don't think about as much in terms of oversight, we also have internal to the agency. Our oversight, in a sense, begins even just with the rank and file agency officers who are looking particularly with respect to information related to U.S. persons. They don't want to collect, you know, vast swaths of information. I think there's a misimpression, you know, that they, um, that we have people who are on the verge of being nefarious, and that's just not the case. I know there, um, the legislation in the 1970s responded to a series of abuses, but that's not the community that I see, and the, not the community I've seen in the year and a half that I've been in my current position. Okay, and, and just to... Oh, go ahead. Can I step in? I, I wanted to respond to, to what Ben had uh, talked about. I, I think um, oversight can do some things effectively and other things less effectively. And uh, I think review of facts is something that 
for example, a congressional oversight panel can look at what, what happened and is this what well, is the system working? Are these the kinds of problems we thought um, should should be solved and is it being addressed in an appropriate way? I think oversight committees can do that. Uh, it's trickier when we're dealing with legal interpretations. Uh, and one of the problems uh, that came up in the Section 215 setting, which is you know the core of what we're talking about in the panel, is what happens when technology has outpaced the statute, when we've got a statute that's drafted for one technological era, new technological era arises, and the natural question is, how do you fit this old technology, or the the new technology into the old statute? Uh, And and, and a congressional oversight panel, or just some information, here's what we're doing, harder for members of Congress, say, to really delve into what does that mean, to sort of say, we think this is working well or not working well, when the questions about what's happening are really legal questions that are deeply embedded that non-lawyer members of the committees might not recognize or even that lawyer members of the committee might not recognize or if they recognize not quite get, whereas a lot of what I think was the Snowden blowback was a sense of the public never had any sense that this sort of a program was going on. Uh, And when it became public, for example, focusing on Section 215, When it became public that Section 215 was being interpreted as it was, there was a lot of head-scratching as to how could that be the case. And I think the Second Circuit's opinion was correct in concluding that the program, as uh, interpreted by the FISC, was uh, was not actually authorized, uh, uh, not interpreted correctly by the FISC, uh, and that the program should not have been authorized under uh, Section 215. And so so the, the, the missing link, I think, is how do you get legal questions answered when it's inherent in new technologies that the application of the law to this new technology is something that's going to be uncertain, unclear, hard to figure out. Um, I I take the USA Freedom uh, Act to be an effort to deal with this by having some sort of public disclosure of what the FISC is up to. I think a better approach would have been to say that the FISC should not be in the game at all of trying to engage in legal interpretation, almost like an executive agency, an administrative agency, trying to figure out you know, how do we implement you know, the, the Food and Drug Act or something. So it's this regulatory role that the FISC has taken on. But, but I think that's the problem that the, the Snow disclosures revealed, is it's hard to get oversight of legal interpretations through secret hearings when the public never finds out what's going on. I mean, one of, one of the, the agencies here are not similarly situated in that, you know, when, you know, NSA operates in the surveillance context under a incredibly elaborate, neurotically detailed statutory scheme, and by and large, human collection is not done under, you know, uh, uh, under that sort of... Uh, Scheme, and so you have the, you know, you have a, a a real dissimilarity in the posture of the agencies vis-a-vis the oversight committees. In in that regard, I think you guys are much more likely to be uh, in the in the sort of factual sweet spot that that Oren is talking about with respect to the congressional committees. And there are these really really novel statutory questions that show up, you know every six months in surveillance, you know, in, in electronic surveillance law that sort of don't show up in human intelligence, where, you know, humans are more or less technologically the same objects that we were in 1947. <laughs> Sadly enough. Um, or if I could follow up on Performance this. enhancing drugs notwithstanding. <laughs> um, or if I could just follow up on this. So we've talked about 215, and I think we're all generally familiar with 215 was the provision, uh, the Patriot Act that provided the authority for the FISA court to issue an order to uh, get a hold of records typically, and, uh, but they had to be relevant to an investigation. It was used to get vast amounts of telephone metadata, put it into a database uh, with, on the theory that all that metadata was relevant to the investigation because you needed all that metadata in order to see patterns and connections between telephone numbers associated with terrorists and, and other people. Um, that is something that was startling. That the, the, the definition of relevance and the court's acceptance of the definition of relevance was startling to people, and that's one of the things that came out after Snowden um, that got people uh, concerned about the adequacy of oversight. But then there's the general question about the third-party doctrine and the idea that third-party records and, and data 
are not protected. You know, Brady versus Maryland case that made that point as it related to sort of a limited amount of telephone um, telephone records, uh, not involving content, just the records, that we didn't have a constitutional expectation of privacy in that data. If you would tell us if you see that we're now in a time of change in terms of our view, the general view and the court's view, as to whether or not that doctrine still applies, given what technology allows us to do, such as pulling together all that metadata in one database and finding patterns and seeing connections between human beings? It's a great question. We don't really know where we are because the Supreme Court had one opportunity to touch on this issue, and uh, they'll have many more opportunities com- coming soon, actually. Uh, lower courts are currently divided on how the Fourth Amendment applies to cell site data, that is, the information uh, that is Uh, collected by the phone company whenever your cell phone is on and being used to send or receive information. The phone company is collecting information about what cell tower you're connected to to locate the call, place the call, and and, and, and the like. Uh, And uh, whether that information is protected under the Fourth Amendment is currently the subject of a circuit split, which tends to prompt Supreme Court review. Uh, Maybe it'll be this term even. It might be next term. But that'll be really the opportunity the Supreme Court has to say, whether the third party doctrine uh, lives entirely in modified form, uh, we, don't, we don't really know. Uh, the Supreme Court had one case that in some sense prompted these issues, the Jones case from 2012, involving GPS, a uh, GPS device physically installed on uh, a car to track its location. Uh, the concurring justices suggested uh, that maybe there should be a, a new approach to the Fourth Amendment that looks beyond just physical entry or uh, sort of looking into private spaces and instead should perhaps monitor over time uh, public observation, uh, monitoring the location of the car. There were hints in that opinion, but not uh, not much more than that. Justice Sotomayor, in her concurring opinion, uh, suggested that it may be time to rethink the third-party doctrine, but she didn't quite say what should replace the third-party doctrine. Uh, And uh, she was actually a moot court judge here uh, on this stage about two years ago. And the problem uh, that uh, the students had had her judge as part of the moot court exercise was a Fourth Amendment issue about the third party doctrine, uh, knowing that Justice Sotomayor was going to be uh, presiding over the moot court. We wanted to sort of get her ideas. And she actually commented after the moot court, she said something along the lines of, oh, come on, I only have one vote. Uh, it was only a one justice concurring. That's a lo- long way from getting a majority of the court. So um, we don't know is the, is the short answer. The, the tension here is an understandable one. As technology changes, government power changes along with it based on some prior rule. And the Supreme Court has a tendency to look at new sets of technological facts and try to adjust prior Fourth Amendment rules in response to these new technologies. So the fact that the government can collect so much more metadata than it used to be able to collect, that it can analyze so much more metadata than it used to be able to analyze, uh, that has created fears that the government has more power. The Fourth Amendment should sort of respond by, by ratcheting back the government's authority, maybe somehow trying to limit access to third-party records. I think the tricky question is, if the court tries to do that, how? You know, what's, what's the mechanism? What's the rule? If you say that metadata uh, is protected by a full warrant authority, sort of protected just like contents of communications, uh, then it so substantially cuts back on government authorities. They, for the most part, you know, government won't be able to collect metadata analysis, at least for domestic uh, collection, so it stops a lot of criminal investigations. But if not a full warrant authority, then what? I mean, you can sort of run through a bunch of options, all of which have their have their problem. So I, I, my own sense is that the third party doctrine is actually an important part of uh, applying the Fourth Amendment to a network. It's, it's basically recognizing that there are some virtual spaces online that are not protected by the Fourth Amendment. Just like in the physical world, the government needs, you know, it, it, it triggers the Fourth Amendment to enter a private space, a home, say, but does not trigger the Fourth Amendment to observe somebody in public. And, and so I think the third party doctrine is an effort to capture that. Where I suspect the court might go uh, is in, or where the law more broadly is going to go, let's sort of take it away from just the the Fourth Amendment, is in more focus, at least in the uh, criminal context, on on use restrictions, recognizing that a lot of the harms that people are 
worried about are not just the collection of information, but what happens to the information once collected. And in the criminal law context, where the cases usually are coming from, there's not as much of a history of having use restrictions. There's the grand jury context, where you'll have the grand jury secrecy rules. But say, if the government um, just observes something in public, there's no limit ordinarily on the government's authority. What do they do with the information? They're allowed to you know, re- release it to the world or put it into a database or no, no particular limitations. And I, I suspect one answer that the courts and, and Congress may focus on in the future is, is maybe allowing collection at the front end, but then limiting the use disclosure of the information at the back end. I just, I, you know, Oren forgets more about this subject in a week than I have ever known. So I, I hesitate to... Uh, disagree with him, but I, I actually think there's uh, another very important pivot point with respect to data in the hands of third parties, which is how integral to our human existences that data is. So I, I, I wrote a paper not too long ago about whether we were all becoming cyborgs, and the answer that the paper posited is absolutely, and by the way, when you try to apply the law to cyborgs uh, in the surveillance context, it gets pretty muddy. Um, but I want to just throw out a hypothetical related to that. You know, there's probably somebody in the audience who has a pacemaker. Pacemakers produce a lot of data, and that data is data that is uh, in the hands of a third party, which is to say the pacemaker manufacturer. It's retrievable from outside your heart. And somehow I don't think Smith v. Maryland would have come out the same. I don't think the Supreme Court would have written the sentence, you know, you didn't have to get that pacemaker, right? You didn't have to voluntarily give this material to a third party, and therefore you don't really have any expectation of privacy in your own heartbeat. And so I think the more integrated with our human existences the technology that puts data in the hands of third parties become the more essential to our, our, our sort of basic humanity. Imagine when the cell phone is actually implanted in your head, right? And you think, I want to talk to Ken Weinstein, but he's you know, somewhere else, and you have what you perceive as a conversation with him, but there's actually metadata generated through that. Um, that is, we're not going to feel the same way that we do about that uh, with a, as a pen register or trap and trace device. And so I think there's, there, there's another element to this, which is the more integrated with our machines we become, the more unstable the third-party doctrine will become as well, and the less we'll feel like you're venturing into that, it, that it's a good analog to that public space in non-digital arenas. Okay, let me go a half step from here. So we've talked about the advances in technology and the pressure that's put on legal structure that we operate under. Let's also talk, Oren, for a second about increasing globalization and the networking of our world and the implications it has on our legal structure and specifically the Microsoft case. So can you just give us a quick thumbnail of the Microsoft case and where you see that going and then the implications for law enforcement and intelligence operations? Sure. So this is a case that was argued in the Second Circuit a few weeks ago. Uh, It involves a search warrant that the government uh, uh, obtained in a criminal case to get data from a suspect in a narcotics case. It's not known if the suspect is outside the U.S. or inside the U.S., U.S. citizen or or not. Uh, But the search warrant uh, was served on Microsoft. They're the provider. And their response to the search warrant was, well, actually, this data is is stored uh, on a server in Ireland. It's not in the United States. And we think the law should only apply, or does only apply territorially to the United States, and therefore that the search warrant can't be used to retrieve information from a server outside the United States, even though Microsoft acknowledges they, they have the technical authority to retrieve the information. Their view is that they should not have to as a matter of law, because the law governing collection of, in the criminal context of the data, should be interpreted to apply only inside the United States. So uh, the government responded, no, we think, you know, we have a search warrant. We we think we should be able to get this information. The trick to it is that the law has no, was was created, this is the Stored Communications Act, part of the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, 
was created in an era where there was not this territorial problem. You had sort of local networks, local providers. You know, you'd have to have a three dollar a minute phone call to, to call abroad to get your data. No one would would do that. Uh, so now we have this obviously global networks, and for a major internet provider, the idea of servers just being in the United States. Well, why would it be there? You want to have uh, servers all around the world to recognize the global customer base that these companies have. Uh, and so the question is, you know, should the law follow the location of the data? Should it follow the, uh, should it be whether the individual monitored or whose account it is as a U.S. person? Uh, the difficulty is that the current statute, not being drafted with this in mind, really does not provide an easy answer to these questions. And uh, I think whoever wins or loses is going to go to, uh, whoever loses, rather, is going to go to Congress and say, you know, we need some sort of new answer to this, recognizing that data location just has a very different meaning today than it did in 1986 when the law was drafted. Uh, why is this issue being litigated today? Well, it's largely a response to the Snowden disclosures. Uh, uh, you know, country, uh, governments in Europe, in particular, I think the German government has been most active, uh, not big fans of the idea that... Uh, accounts held by German citizens or even German government accounts that may be serviced by these U.S. internet providers may have data that is accessible to U.S. criminal law authorities. Uh, you know, that, that doesn't uh, rub the Europeans too well. So, so there's a lot of money that's potentially at stake for the U.S. companies if they lose this case, which is one of the reasons why they would uh, go to Congress pretty quickly if, if they do lose the case. That's a case currently pending in the Second Circuit. Uh, you know, should come out and who knows, a month or two. But that's an example of how you know, law drafted with one set of facts is being applied to an entirely different set of facts. And the key question of location is just not, you, you find nothing looking at the legislative history of the law that anybody ever thought about the question. Okay, let me ask a related question. This goes to, Caroline, what you mentioned, the executive order 1233. And I'll direct this to Ben and Caroline. Um, some have said that because of increased globalization and travel and communications by U.S. persons around the world, that the distinction that was drawn when 12333 first was um, drafted, I guess, in the late 70s, and I guess more or less in its more final form, 8081, I guess, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the distinction between that, that allowed the uh, intelligence community to collect intelligence by surveillance overseas without any court order, and, and what, of course, fell within FISA, had to be done through the FISA court, that that maybe is no longer viable because so much of that collection now collects U.S. person information. And I know the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board has suggested that, and that they are taking, undertaking a review of 12333, and at least some number of the members have said that they're looking at that particular issue. Um, ben, do you see that as a concern? When you look at, um, at 12333, how it's operated uh, and how it's protected U.S. person rights, do you think that given this international integration that we now have, that maybe it's no longer protecting rights as it was originally contemplated? Well, so, I, I mean, I, I think that, first of all, the basic division between what the intelligence community is allowed to do within the United States, which is A, very limited, and B, almost entirely conditioned by uh, law enforcement norms, uh, versus what it's allowed to do overseas with respect to non-U.S. persons. That basic division, I, I can't think of an alternative to it. Um, you know, unless you want to say that really intelligence everywhere should be conditioned by law enforcement norms, or we should have sort of open season on U.S. persons domestically. I, I think you've got to draw that seam somewhere. I mean, to put it crudely, if, if David Chris were here, I think he would say something like the basic division is between a highly regulated law enforcement approach domestically, and overseas you're kind of allowed to use a vacuum cleaner approach, right? And that's the basic 1947 compromise, then and refined all through the years. Now, if, unless you're going to say you never get to use a vacuum cleaner, 
or you, you know, can use a vacuum cleaner all the time. You have to have some rule that, that divides the world and the people within it. Um, and I'm not sure what other than either citizenship or citizenship as expanded by this little concept of U.S. persons, what other than that and location gets you to it? Does technology make that much, much harder? Yes. I mean, it's just technically hard now to figure out when you're acquiring a piece of information whether that's a large trove of information that a human source is giving you that you don't know may include a whole lot of U.S. person information, or more realistic, more, more commonly, you're surveilling a network and you don't know um, the, commu- the, the phone, where is it, you don't know, who holds it, you don't know. You know, your office phone, we know where it is, and we know where the person who answers it is. And so those questions get really difficult. The conceptual question, I think, has become more difficult as a result of a series of technological changes. But I've never heard anyone pose what I think is a real alternative to, to the basic territorial division. Now, I do think there is a, a, a... a, a, you can call it a spiritual problem, you can call it a, a public relations problem. I'm not sure, I think it's more than a public relations problem. I don't know if it quite rises to the level of spirituality. But um, look, when, when the Snowden revelations happened and the president and the, the DNI and the, you know, the head of the agency, uh, the NSA, all said, look, what, what, you know, we have all these protections for U.S. persons involved, and you should feel reassured. That turned out, that was a good enough answer in 1978. And it turns out that it's not a good enough answer now. And the reason is that a lot of Germans didn't find it very reassuring. A lot of Brazilians didn't find it reassuring. The, you know, the chancellor of Germany was sort of offended by it. Um, and U.S. industry, which you know, looks at the same people that the intelligence community looks at and sees targets, and they see customers. And 95% of the world and most of their growth opportunity is not in the department of U.S. persons. And so I don't diminish at all the difficulty of navigating that line, that seam between whatever you want to call it. Is it 12 triple, you know, 12 triple three, 702 is an attempt to navigate that seam, and, you know, domestic law enforcement rules are an attempt to navigate that seam. But I, no one has ever put forward to me what the alternative to having that seam is. Okay, well said. Caroline, any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, well, I, as you said, the PCOB is looking, their mission is focused on counterterrorism, so they're looking at um, some activities of the agency as well as the NSA with respect to activities conducted under 12333. And we, of course, will welcome whatever recommendations and guidance they have um, with respect to, to what they find. Um, but I do think, generally speaking, that the Attorney General approved guidelines that we have that protect um, U.S. person information are working. And as Ben is alluding to, it's definitely harder to apply them now than it it used to be. So, for example, if you in the past might have had a situation where we went into the home of overseas of a hostile foreign agent and stole some hard copy files, you know, that would be very simple to know that that was not something that triggered um, any extra protections under 12333. But now if we're monitoring that same hostile foreign agent overseas um, in terms of their online activities, well, what if they have um, materials stored on a cloud, and what if that cloud is sourced back to the U.S., then you might uh, bump up into our restrictions on uh, any electronic surveillance in the United States. So definitely things are are harder now than they used to be, um, but I'm not sure that I know what reform um, could solve that, that problem. And then the problem, there's definitely a problem in terms of, uh, or concern from, those who are not U.S. persons who are concerned, you know, with being treated, being treated, um, who would like to be treated to the same regime, perhaps, that U.S. persons are, are treated to. And I know that the administration has tried to at least partially address those concerns, for example, with PBD-28, which, um, which the president um, asked for um, appropriate uh, parity, basically, to be applied when possible to um, the privacy interests of 
non-U.S. persons as well as U.S. persons. In terms of in minimization. Terms of, yeah, in terms of signals, intelligence, and what, what exactly the kinds of protections, when you can apply them, the 12 triple three protections, the AG guidelines, to a non-U.S. person, do it when you can for signals, intelligence. You know, so that's something that is in that directive. Okay. All right, let me shift gears here for a second, Caroline. Um, the advent of the uh, cyber age um, presents opportunity, but also vulnerabilities uh, for the intelligence community. Um, you want to speak to that and also to the reorganization that you've gone through to, uh, that seeks to address that? Sure. Um, so um, in terms of our, one of our, the key parts of our modernization, um, which you'll be hearing more about in the next panel, is the establishment of the um, digital dire- the Directorate uh, for Digital Innovation, which we're, uh, the agency are very excited about. It's the first time we've established a directorate since the 1960s, and Andrew Hallman, who is the head of that um, organization, will be, I think, on the next panel, so he can talk a little bit more about it. But the idea is um, to integrate um, all of the different capabilities that we already had across the agency into one place, um, and the functions of that group range from um, increasing cybersecurity for our own systems to um, helping uh, analysts um, who are analyzing foreign intelligence to have the right tools so they can pull together data from a number of sources and use it the most effectively um, to helping with cover, you know, as you're saying, challenges and opportunities. One of the real challenges that um, our operators face in this new world of, um, we call it digital dust is that you know, they're supposed to be undercover and undetected by a foreign intelligence service. And now, wherever they go, um, they have a profile, they're, you know, they're um, an online presence. And so it's much harder, I think, to make sure that they're not um, targeted by a hostile service or just otherwise discovered. And so that, that's an area where it's definitely a challenge. And then, on the other hand, it can present those same challenges or opportunities for us as we conduct our own operations. Okay, last question. I'll open up to questions from the floor um, for anybody who wants to jump in. Just very um, briefly, the going dark issue uh, and the going dark issue as it relates to encryption um, and where do you see that going and what, what is needed? I'll start with you, Caroline. Uh, so I think you know, encryption um, has many uh, useful benefits in terms of protecting freedom of expression and in terms of protecting commerce, and it's something that Um, people are coming to expect, and it's sort of a necessary um, aspect of doing business. By the same token, um, it can be misused by um, our adversaries in terms of terrorists, in terms of even domestic criminals, Um, and then it's very hard for the U.S. government, whether it's um, people, you know, within the intelligence community or law enforcement to try to solve crimes and prevent terrorist um, incidents because we can't get in through that encryption. So I know that the administration across the um, board is working with the private sector to make sure that they understand the national security and other law enforcement concerns with encryption and see if there's any way forward um, in, in that area. Maybe. I mean, I think, you know, a, a, a year ago, uh, Director Comey uh, gave a speech uh, in which he really sort of laid out the problem from his point of view, both with respect to data at rest and with respect to data in motion. Uh, He said he wanted to provoke a conversation. I I think he did that. I mean, I think there really was, has been a pretty robust conversation over the last year about it. Uh, And the result has been that the administration has decided not to seek legislation on the subject, which I suspect was not probably the outcome of the conversation that, that Director Comey had in mind when he, when, when he initiated the conversation. Um, you know, whether that is a stable outcome, I think really will depend in the long run on whether bad things that happen seem to have as a significant part of their causal link uh, that collection couldn't take place in a useful form as a result of uh, the routine deployment of encryption by major uh, carrier services. And look, there is a profound uh, clash of security interests here. You know, from a cybersecurity point of view, you want systems to be as uh, resistant to intrusions as possible. And from a collection point of view and from a law enforcement point of view, you want 
the guys who you think of as targets not to be perfectly secure. And that's a, that, you know, that's a conflict of our, own, of our own security interests that I think eventually it, it, it is, you know, we have to decide who we want to win that. And that's a, that's a hard question. Yeah, I mean, I think these are tough questions in part because we can see where the technology is going, but we don't yet have the scenarios clear and to, to kind of really know what is the impact going to be in order to sort of preemptively take directions that may be wiser or, or less wise. So, so to some extent, we kind of have to wait and see, but you know, let's hope that the wait and see ends up being something that shows, yes, this was a good path to go down, not, not a bad path to go down. I, I suspect also that... Uh, over time, thinking, you know, I'm coming from the criminal law context, the criminal law system will probably come up with ways to adjust around this problem, too. So just like technology, as it expands government power, the courts, you know, tend to ratchet up protections. When you have a technology that limits government power, you'll probably find courts lowering protection. So it may be that they're less likely to have Fourth Amendment protection for metadata because the metadata is the stuff that's in the clear that's not encrypted. And so uh, you, maybe you have, as the government can access less content, uh, you have you know, less uh, willingness to also have constitutional protection for metadata. Uh, or it may come out in the Fifth Amendment context where there's a big question of uh, when the government knows the suspect, when they try to get the code from the suspect, the passcode or password. Uh, you know, what are the Fifth Amendment limits, I think, to the extent going dark issue becomes a real problem, courts are going to be much less reluctant to say that there's a substantial Fifth Amendment barrier to getting the information from the, from the target. So, so there's a, you know, a lot of different rivers here, and, and, and we'll see how the technology evolves, but, but I think the courts will respond one way or another. Well, let's hope it's resolved before, as Ben said, it, you know, we're looking at this after an attack to see whether there was some piece of communication that could have prevented the attack that wasn't detectable because of this issue. Okay, let's um, ask if any of the purple-haired people out there would like to <laughs> ask any questions. And if you do, wave your hands feverishly because it's hard for us to see. Oh, let there be light. Good. Okay. Who has a question? I guess over here to the right. Yep. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brian Enriquez, and this question is uh, for you, Mr. Weinstein, or um, for Caroline. Um, and it regards the issues of when something comes up in which there's a competing operational need with perhaps... Um, a privacy um, as the other competing need, but there, you know, the AGG guidelines perhaps aren't very clear, or the, as the panel's named, the 21st century issues are changing so rapidly that there isn't clear guidance. So you, from the general counsel point of view, how would you counsel your client, you know, in the face of this uncertainty when there's this competing operational need that's immediate? There's also uh, considerations to be had on the legal side. Great question. Yeah. So I think the way I'd approach that is I would try to present the whoever my client was um, with the best um, understanding that I have of the law based on how I understood the technological advance and where the uncertainty lay and um, tell him or her whether or not I thought it was permissible to go ahead with the operation and what the legal risk would be in terms of going ahead because it sounds from the hypothetical like there would be legal risk and, um, and how, I saw, how I thought that would play out. Okay. We have somebody over here. Hi. Christian Beckner, Deputy Director of the Center for Cyber and Homeland Security here okay. at GW. So this question is not mine, but we've been soliciting questions via Twitter. So this comes from Steve Bay. A uh, question about uh, are there or will there ever be a legal way for companies to hack back against hackers who hit us? So I don't know if you want to talk about that or more generally against the issues of active defense against cyber threats. <laughs> it's all uh, you, Warren. <laughs> uh, well, uh, you know, the, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the computer hacking statute, has an exception for government uh, hacking. Uh, so that is an, an express exception. There's no express exception for private sector hacking. Uh, so currently that would generally be illegal, a felony under a lot of contexts, under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Uh, whether there should be an exception, uh, Congress may revisit this issue at some point. Uh, and we, you know, it, the, the hard question is, what should the statute look like if Congress tries to address this? Um, you know, who should be allowed to hack back when subject to what liability and what oversight? You, 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 it's, it's easy to say, oh, here's a U.S. company that's 
being uh, attacked by what we think is a foreign government or uh, a foreign company. We want them to be able to disable the attack. But how do you do that without also saying, well, here's this 14-year-old, and he thinks he's being attacked, and so he wants to hack back too, but it turns out he's wrong, and actually in trying to hack back anyway, he, he misfires, gets the wrong, you know, directs his attack at the wrong place, and then they attack back, and then they're also under attack, and then they attack back, and you, it might unleash more of a problem than it tries to solve. So uh, if Congress tries to address this, it would have to do it in a pretty narrow way, subject to pretty strong oversight, and exactly how to do that, I think, is a tricky question. Okay, do we have somebody, we have a gentleman over here. Thank you for taking my question. Um, we've recently seen the U.S. government approach uh, money being held overseas in a two-pronged approach, offering amnesty uh, to those U.S. citizens who are storing their money overseas and uh, going after the banks that were holding that money uh, seemingly illegally, uh, taking down that whole infrastructure. Do you, given that data has an intrinsic value like money, do you see that being an approach, uh, for instance, of this uh, U.S. provider who had its server overseas of going down that road to bring that data home so we can use it for surveillance? So maybe just to make sure I understand the point of your question. So you're positing the situation where, let's say, the U.S. government has gone after Swiss banks. Um, yes. And um, have succeeded in sort of radically changing or dramatically changing the operations of Swiss banks and yes. make them hue to American expectations and laws. The question is whether you could do the same with companies that hold data overseas, such as Microsoft? Exactly. Use the same strategy? Warren? I'm not sure I know enough about the strategy itself to, to comment on. Well, it was... I've got a client in this area, so maybe I'm a little biased, but the idea was that it, the, the government... Um, made a concerted effort to go after some of the Swiss banks that it saw as harboring this money and with knowledge that the money, at least some amount of that money was being there, was put there in order to avoid taxes. I mean, I think, I, I, I think the analogy is actually, I'm, I'm really speaking off the cuff here, but I, I think the analogy is a little bit flawed. I mean, the reason companies uh, have data in foreign countries is largely that they have customers in foreign countries. It's not that, you know, Microsoft is not storing data in Ireland uh, to keep it out of jurisdiction of, of, of U.S. courts as a general matter. That may be a collateral uh, effect. Most data, a lot of data gets stored here uh, of foreign people is, 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 the, is, is the bigger norm. And so I, I, I don't think you have, you know, there, there is a big push in a lot of countries to, uh, f toward data localization, and it's generally not a good thing. You know, it, it generally creates uh, a sort of more balkanized internet. And so I, I think the, the analogy between data and money is, is, in this context is probably, uh, probably more alluring than accurate. Interesting concept, though. Okay. Um, do we have time for one more question? Well, we will until we get the hook. How about person right there? Thank you. Um, I'd like to follow up on Ben's analogy of the third-party data from the pacemaker. As we move to the Internet of Things where everything around us that we use is attached to the internet, I believe we potentially have the same problem that we are defined by our devices and our humanity may be lost in those devices and your refrigerator talking to your refrigerator company is on steroids and it's everything that you own that's talking to a third party data owner. Do you envision the same kind of concern and reaction as you give for your pacemaker analogy? So it's a very interesting question, and I, I think generally speaking, I, I, would, I would personally divide the world of the Internet of Things into two distinct categories. One is, you know, luxury items that, you know, are kind of cool, that they derive some benefit from connectivity. 
And I have a kind of bloodless attitude toward that. You know, if you want to connect your washing machine to the internet, uh, you do that at some level of risk that there's going to be some data and that, that you're... I, I'm sorry? Well, so, 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 so that brings me to, you know, I, I, category number two. Like, I mean, there's lots of things that we're connecting to the internet because we feel like it and it's fun and it's kind of, we derive some very marginal benefit from the refrigerator knowing exactly what temperature we want X thing at a particular time of day. And, I, and my view of that is that is genuinely Smith v. Maryland kind of data voluntarily entrusted to a third party. And if that ends up in the hands of an investigator, uh, tough luck. I mean, I'm just not very sympathetic to that problem. There, but your second... But your point is exactly correct. What happens when the, first of all, when we start inventing new devices that actually serve some, where the connection is much more organic, much more uh, affirming of some value that we take seriously, or that you simply lose the ability to choose to have a refrigerator that's not internet connected um, because of, uh, consumer pressure um, in that direction. And there I think the, 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 the question becomes more complicated. Now, I, I do think the much bigger factor, to me anyway, is how intrinsically connected to us is it. A refrigerator is at the end of the day a refrigerator. A phone, the way we use phones... You know, the Supreme Court, nine justices, I think eight justices, uh, signed an opinion saying that uh, the proverbial visitor from another planet would think it was part of the human anatomy. You know, I, I didn't make that up, right? That's, that's what the Supreme Court has already said. And I do think that's, that's, that's going to be where, um, where I think at least as an initial matter, the real... The, the real puzzle in the cyborgization area comes from. But I do think pervasiveness is another factor. If everything's connected to the internet, then are you really, are you really engaging in a public behavior by opening your refrigerator? I think it's a fair question. Okay, I think we've got to move toward winding this up. I, for one, have learned a number of fascinating things from our panel, including that Ben has no sympathy for our refrigeration needs. Uh, <laughs> but beyond that, um, I think this has been tremendously stimulating, and um, I just want to thank our panelists. Appreciate it. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Thanks this week to George Washington University and the CIA for giving us permission to use this audio. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. And as always, Please spread the word and promote the Lawfare podcast via your social networks. Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat if you're too embarrassed by your obsession, Wicker if you're keeping secrets, email, and in any other way you can. Thanks for listening.